Hello, everyone. Hello, hello. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for, for attending, uh, whether in person or remotely. Uh, this week's discussion is an oldie but a goodie. Uh, we'll be discussing the cultural history and observance of Ohigan. And Ohigan is a, a topic we've discussed numerous, time, numerous times. Monshin Sensei has done this discussion at least once or twice a year for at least 25 years plus. So uh, I, I apologize in advance for those who have heard this discussion numerous times, uh, but hopefully it still may be of value for those who haven't. Uh, but it is, uh, it's repeated, this discussion is repeated often enough because it's very timely, meaning we will always be marking this time period with this discussion because uh, Higan, spans the week around each equinox, three days on either side and the equinox itself. So there are two Higan periods, uh, a spring and a fall, thus March and September. Ohigan is placing an honorific on the period of time as a, a praise of its importance. And thus Ohigan is, as a celebration is Japanese in origin and use. Although this seasonal time of year is observed in many other religious or agrarian cultures in many different ways. What I hope to get to today is how do we understand the purpose and use of this particular uh, seasonal celebration and how do we translate relevance and perceived value to our own situations? Let's see if I can do the slide. Perfect. Okay. Um, of course, I'm going to start with a little bit of history, um, but hope to get out of uh, get that out of the way pretty quickly, because uh, Higan uh, are he and Gan are the characters for the Chinese translation of Sanskrit's "The Other Shore." This immediately tells you a little bit about uh, about this period. The o Other Shore refers to both the crossing over of life to death but also from delusion to awakening, samsara to nirvana. In that way, we may def define Ohigan as an ancestral memorial and a conviction revitalization. In my discussion last month about Nara Buddhism, I referenced an influential ruler of the 8th century, uh, Emperor Shomu. He was a very devout Buddhist. Uh, he was the first ruler to actually abdicate um, and then leave the home uh, to take vows and put on priest robes. He was also the initiator of the Kokobunji, the nationally sponsored temple network across that young nation uh, of that time. As this was happening, Emperor Shomu also established Ohigan uh, around both equinox, setting into motion the tradition we see today. This development was particular in that it, that it would provide a way to bridge between what seems like three distinct phenomena, geographically specific pre-Shinto folk traditions, agrarian seasonal trends, and Buddhism's introduction, practice, and spread. In that way, Ohigan became just a way to unify these three. Se seasonal shifts would have been observed, celebrated, ritualized by early animistic folk religions. So we assume that various groups observed it in various ways. And between the planting of spring, the sowing of su summer, and the harvesting of autumn, between each of these, a farmer may be able to pause a bit and spend a, a, some of that extra time deepening their ideals. Or at least that was Emperor Shomu's uh, wish. It obviously also gave the Buddhist faithful an opportunity to renew their vows, deepen their practice, and show gratitude for the awakening of compassion and wisdom on their paths. It, it seems that the, the contemplations of crossing over may have pervaded much of the early underlying influence. We can only imagine what thoughts and considerations were going on um, when Ohigan was being conceived, Without doubt, there is much that went into establishing it that we cannot know, especially the what is the perceived roles it would play, what message it would carry, and how popular it would become. 
but it's the test of time that has proven its relevance and value. If this week-long observance did not make sense for the Japanese people of 750 CE, for example, to say nothing of those uh, since that time, it would not have lasted as it has. And it's in this way that Ohigan came to fill many sociocultural roles to remain within Jap Japan's history. Although it did not become a national holiday until the Meiji Restoration in the late 19th, uh, early 20th centuries, generally speaking, over time, Ohigan became a time to reflect and remember our loved ones who have crossed over to the other shore, a time for families to visit, clean and decorate the graves, recite sutras and prayers, and offer rice balls and sushi and other decorations, donations. And to pray for their ancestors for good health and success at home and at work. Most temples hold ohigan ceremonies, either in expressing gratitude for the Buddhist path or memorial services for those visiting families. And traditionally, it's a time to re-examine and reignite into our lives the six paramita, but more on those in a little bit. Based on what we just discussed, we can make a few, a couple inferences. One, that early Shinto Japanese life had embedded within it ancestor worship and a ritualized observance of seasonal changes. And the other, that the particular imported Buddhism of that time was able to accommodate those types of observances and unify the practice, practices under a certain framework. If it's my belief that these two presumptions lay the groundwork for the concept of Ohigan really taking shape in Japan. Although undoubtedly the perspective use and observance of Ohigan has changed dramatically since that early development. People's celebration of Ohigan now may be much more like what we do with Thanksgiving. It's a time to see family and express gratitude. But honestly, how many of us actually observe it? How many actually celebrate it in the way that it was truly intended? We have, to, we, we have changed the way we relate to those aspects of our lives. In Japan, ohigan may be the only way someone finds out if their family is Soto Zen or Jodo uh, Shin Buddhist. Um, this may be the only tradition that gets someone to visit any other uh, visit any type of Buddhist temple, maybe other than uh, New Year's. They all are choosing how to do ohigan in their own way. We all choose how to observe. To, and to what extent and with what intent any celebration or holiday. Regardless, there is a purpose and value um, in people's lives. To that end, uh, history may be one way to help, uh, help us understand some of the cultural context. Um, we can also use uh, cultural perspectives and philosophy to help us make sense of Ohigan. After all, the introduction, adoption, and longstanding use of it doesn't happen in a vacuum. It has to make sense and feel natural to commemorate the period. Again, it has to be meaningful for those who have had, uh, who, um, has to be meaningful for it to have had the impact it has. Therefore, the underlying principles and reasonings needed to find cultural congruency within the Japanese perspective. The philosophy and reasoning, I won't say logic because I don't really speak logic, but the reason behind this is rooted in what is worthwhile to people. It's fulfilling a need. And then traditions and rituals were built around it, providing meaning. Uh, that, that is to say, it provides a venue to get family or loved ones back together to celebrate and remember ancestors but also to simply pause and reflect on how to be better. We may be fearful of the colder weather to come or appreciative of the recent warmer weather we just had. We may need solace for those we have lost, need time to reflect on how to learn more or to live uh, a better life. So these periods of time or even certain days started to carry a lot of meaning. They gained more definitiveness, 
cultural and, and, gener and generational particularities. But still at the base, the celebration fulfilled a role of providing a venue of sorts of space and time to explore, reconnect, uh, reflect, and renew. As an example, seasonal changes are defined in various ways throughout various cultures. Now, seasonal change may not be as much of a focus in our culture, uh, at least currently. But to me, at least, the, taking this time feels natural. And presumably, it does to others, based on holidays in other faith traditions or cross-culturally. And, many, and maybe it's because of our shared humanness. We have been given an evolutionary generational attunement to these natural changes. So it may seem natural to pay, to pay particular attention in whatever way to this shift. A somewhat related reasoning is, is, one's, is one that it's a bit harder for me to grasp personally. That the Ohigan is celebrated when um, as the spiritual plane and the physical plane are in closest alignment. That phrase, <laughs> for me particularly, uh, I, I couldn't make sense of it. Um, spiritual plane, I couldn't re re relate to it in the same way. Um, I can understand equal day and night as to what the equinox actually is. It's, that's natural science. That makes sense to me. But it was, it was actually acupuncture school that really helped me because it's a lot of Taoist philosophy, noticing natural phenomena and how it all can be infinitely divisible into yin and yang. It seems confusing to, to know that acupuncture school is how Ohigan starts to make sense to me, um, but it was in learning about yin yang philosophy where I learned that the equinox is more than just equal day and night. If everything is divisible into yin and yang, so could a full year. With the height of the summer, the solstice, it is full yang, fire, an expensive, an expansive, outward, bright energy. The, and the winter solstice, being full yin, is dark and, and water element, a, a, a nutritive inward energy. And the equinox obviously being the shift between the two. It is the moment, uh, the movement from yin to yang and back to yin um, as a rhythm, like a circadian rhythm that we do every moment, every day, month, season, or even year. And we should remember that the Chinese Buddhism being introduced to Japan was already being influenced by Taoism. Then add the inclusion of a more animistic Shinto influence, Buddhism would take on a more nature-ist perspective. And so it's been observed that the yearly seasonal change and certain times of, uh, and other certain times of the year, they carry a certain amount of weight. They feel different, experientially, uh, intuitively, naturally. Again, not necessarily logically. If we think of the summer solstice, it might carry more importance if one could make sense of yang being at its zenith and understanding the impl implications thereof. It's a turning point. Looking at the picture on the right, imagine that the red line is an x-axis and the line between yin and yang ebbs and flows around and across that line. Imagine this was a the timeline of the year. Thus, when white reaches its apex, that's the summer solstice. And the apex of black on the opposite side is the winter solstice. Thus, the arrows uh, are uh, uh, pointing to the crossing points of the x-axis when yin and yang are equal. Thus, the equinox, that's ohigan. In understanding only a little bit about yin and yang, I can at least imagine that when they are equal, it's kind of a big deal. In this way, Ohigan too is a transition point in our year. Equal parts yin and yang, light and dark. In fact, all qualities of yin and yang, like heaven and earth, are equal too. 
And maybe not heaven, but what about divine and mundane? Or I go back to the phrase that hung me up in the first place, uh, when the spiritual and physical are equal. Fill in the dichotomies that make sense to you, because this example may not light you up like it did me, but it is hopefully enough to suspend your disbelief in order to ask, why not the equinox? What other better time do we have? Buddhism itself, on the whole, has very few holidays. But culturally, each place Buddhism has been introduced has found ways of integrating its philosophy into the current cultural paradigm of each region. And some have gravitated to these particular times of year and have grafted meaning onto them to better make sense, to better use them, making them more fulfilling. In this way, in Japan, this particular transition also implies not just ancestral connection, but a religious connection too. As I referred to before, there are several crossing over concepts in Buddhism. One crosses from this shore of ignorance and suffering to the other shore of awakening and peace. There are examples as early as the Pali Canon discussing the analogy of uh, constructing a raft to cross from one shore to another, symbolizing awakening. The Heart Sutra, the mantra, gate gate para gate para sam gate bodhisvaha, gone, gone, gone beyond, parasamgate, even gone beyond that, to the other shore, awakening, bodhi, so be it, svaha. During Ohigan, then, we may, may find that our ability to embody the Buddhist spirit into our daily corporeal lives may be more accessible. We may feel more inspired or more purposeful. A time when our bodhicitta, our seed of awakening, our driving force on the bodhisattva path can have more of a say in our daily actions, being able to better balance do it, but because, again, based on reasonings, this seems like a natural and more efficacious time to do it. Traditionally, it is, uh, it is for this reason that we re-emphasize the six paramita, the six perfections. They are not a practice in and of themselves, but the qualities that we bring to our practice, to our lives. They are not a practice, they are, uh, if we wish to cross over, uh, achieve awakening, then the tools to do that are in being the six paramita. And to embody them, we need to explore and be honest with ourselves as to how we have done thus far and where improvements can be made going forward. Again, if the reasonings are true, and this is in fact an auspicious time, one might imagine that that exploration may be more fruitful, may, may be able to find deeper meaning and or connect to them more strongly. We also might imagine that for those celebrating Ohigan in Japan, there may be a person, for example, who mourns their late grandmother and how she was such a positive influence in their life. The six paramita become a convincing teacher as to how grandma was so kind, loving, compassionate, and in and this in turn uh, provides the qualities that that person wants to replicate for their own children and their grandchildren. It becomes a bell of mindfulness, a guiding force that ensuring our use of a perfect, huh, or at least a more sound raft <laughs> to that other shore. Therefore, the six paramita are a way of revitalizing our wholesome desires, that of complete, unexcelled awakening. Through all of this, to me, Ohigan feels inspirational. Whether the reason is that it, it, it's a seasonal change, or when yin or yang are equal, 
or when my lost loved ones are closest to me spiritually, if anything else, at least it's a consistent time of year to check in and re-engage. If we're paying attention, we kind of feel like it, it, this, is an, it, this is a natural transition time. It's the end of summer, school starting, vacations presumably ending, the long-awaited arrival of pumpkin spice everything. Uh, because really, Ohigan is a time to help us notice nature's change and impermanence and the natural melancholy and equanimity of that process. It's natural to notice the changes, and some choose to demarcate that time in particular ways. And these ways may be foreign. I will admit, celebrating Ohigan here or outside of Japan in general is foreign, and its observance is in cultural translation. So in the end, many people may ask themselves, so what? Why Ohigan? How does Ohigan become important to us in providing purpose and meaning? Having briefly considered the history and philosophy of Ohigan and attempting to generally translate what it provides to the common Japanese, we should explore what parts make sense to us outside of Japan. One can presume that the uh, um, presume that to a Japanese culture steeped in caring for one's ancestors, this equality of heaven and earth, light and dark, made sense to them, gave them a meaningful time to connect to those lost. And thus, some of these philosophical explanations may have provided that reasoning. But we can only understand and incorporate those elements that make sense in, uh, to aspects of our own culture and our own perspective. Strengthening familial ties, feeling more comfortable with the idea of dying, paying respects and being grateful for those who are no longer with us, an opportunity to learn and grow for renewing our vows, reinvigorating a practice, or at least acknowledging and showing thanks to our Mother Earth. Whatever the value that the time can provide, it is only as valuable as we make it. We either mark this time and make it different, distinct, and meaningful, or we don't. So the question of so what is more of a question of what is it that we hold important? And how do we demonstrate that? And in the case of Ohigan, how do we use this history and cultural context and current use in Japan to help provide something we can adapt and hopefully adopt? In the appropriation of Ohigan, understanding its place in Japanese culture and history is helpful in understanding what the holiday can offer us and how we can best observe this influential time of the year. Therefore, how do we translate the purpose and meaning of Ohigan into something that is more culturally relevant, if that's even necessary? What do we take away from the tradition? It's an ascribed time set aside for a search for solace and or generally just reconnecting. It may be connecting to those who have, uh, who have passed to relearn from those memories. It may be a way to inwardly connect on the balance of our religious and mundane life. Have we kept the precepts? Have, I, have we lived by the Eightfold Path? Have I been kind, generous, patient, or virtuous? It's natural to need those times, if not daily during our daily practice, at least during these times of year. We have considered some of the things that Ohigan can fulfill, but do those needs make sense to us? Do we have to apply additional meaning to make it more meaningful? If Ohigan seems pointless to you, what would it make, what would make it feel more purposeful? What is it that encourages us, giving us that glimpse of the other shore? In America, in my opinion, 
We do not put enough emphasis upon our deceased family members. But does ancestor worship have a place in our society and culture? How can the deceased bring us back together again to reestablish family bonds? Can caring for one's ancestors help reach the other shore? Does it work even as a purely Buddhist holiday? Or do Jado Christian influences or other Western cultural paradigms get introduced? All these questions are a way to get to what are the lasting characteristics of Ohigan that will remain while outside of Japan? And I should say, by the way, I have no answers for any of these questions. I mean, I, I have a sense for myself of what, what you know, how I, I might answer that. But it, that's not an answer for everyone. Really, in order to consider any answers, we must continually engage learn from, and experience this holiday so that we can allow ourselves a chance to dip into its wisdom. At TBI, we will always demarcate this time. We traditionally hold retreats uh, these weekends, as we will do in an abridged version this weekend. We do the Sagaki ceremony, appeasing and helping those who have passed. And in the future, we hope to hold additional programming, like other special ceremonies, both spring and fall, all as a way to encourage continual engagement. Time will tell us what answers we may find from these questions, but only through the doing. Putting our egos aside and allowing our bodhicitta to take the lead, we allow for the six paramita to shine forth as we cross to the other shore. Um, and before I stop there, I will ask, I don't know if Ichishima Sensei is here, or at least for Monshin Sensei, if there is anything that you would like to say or mention, um, I would ask for that now. Um, and then we'll open it up for questions and comments. Why don't you, why don't we unmute and do that? Yeah, um, you're unmuted, so if you wanted okay. to add anything. <clears throat> well, I was just going to say that um, thank you very much, Koshin, for the presentation this evening. And um, the flower that you see there is often associated with Ohigan. It's actually a spider lily. And the reason that the spider lily is used during Ohigan is because it blossoms in both the spring and in the fall around Ohigan. And it's uh, and it's um, actually uh, in Japan called the higan bana, so the the flower of of higan, um, and is often planted in and around um, uh, graveyards. Right. So I thought you'd find that interesting. It's one of the flowers. That... 